Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Welcome back to another episode of Male Bonding, the podcast where we look back at the James Bond films and give our two cents worth. I'm Patrick, and with me, as always, are two 007 fans. First, he's the author of Duty Honor Empire, a 25th century love story, Chris Haley. Hey, how much is two cents in British pounds, do you know? I think it's like one pound, or one cent, or one pound. I don't know, it's something like that. Finally, the youngest member of our group and our designated Q representative, Matt Palmer. I am uncomfortably old Matt today. <laughs> okay. All right, welcome everyone. And this week, uh, we take a break from reviewing a specific James Bond film and actually look back at the Roger Moore films in retrospective to give our official take on the third official James Bond and his seven films. And normally we'd start off with a summary, but there is no summary for the Roger Moore film franchise, unless Matt wants to summarize it in like ten, two sentences. Sure. He's old. <laughs> started off young. He got older. Was he really that young when he started off, though? Actually, two years older than Sean Connery when he started. Uh, not that young. All right. Roger Moore makes his debut it with... God, with uh, black exploitation, <laughs> black exploitation film "Live and Let Die," released on June twenty seventh, nineteen seventy three, opens with a thirty five thirty five million dollar box office, nineteenth highest grossing film in the James Bond film franchise as of today, uh, adjusted for inflation. Uh, that's actually about one hundred and sixty two million. Uh, so it's it's a decent number. It's a de- de- decent debut. Follows that up a couple of years later actually one year later with the man with the golden gun released on december 18th of 1974 a james bond film within 18 months who who can believe it back in those days that they could crank these things out as quickly as they did however it's almost like a Def leopard album or something <laughs> no those take decades to make man what are you talking about uh and then there's always someone who doesn't survive to the next one uh the Man with the Golden Gun, however, disappoints, uh, grosses only uh, just shy of $21 million, is the currently the 23rd highest grossing film out of 24 in the James Bond film franchise, counting Never Say Never Again. Uh, adjusted for inflation, it is, it's a paltry uh, $91 million. Uh, 20, it's still 23rd in the uh, film franchise, only outgrossed License to Kill from 1989, which doesn't bode well for Timothy Dalton. But then they take a break for a little bit. They come back with The Spy Who Loved Me. It releases uh, on July 13th of 1977, so about two and a half years later. And that film comes out and grosses uh, over $46 million. So it outgrosses Live and Let Die, outgrosses The Man with the Golden Gun. And that's the 16th highest grossing in the James Bond film franchise to date. Uh, Adjusted for inflation, that is actually bumps up to 15th and would be $170 million in today's box office. Then they followed up, unfortunately... With the classic <laughs> with Moonraker, the uh, Star Wars exploitation film that was released on June 29th of 1979, grossing in 1979 dollars 70 million dollars over 70 million dollars. That would put it currently as the eighth highest grossing James Bond film, but adjusted for inflation, that would be 227 million dollars in excess of. And it would pop it all the way to number five of the highest grossing film, uh, James Bond film franchise. So at this point, Bond is very much alive and well as long as we shoot him off into space and there's lasers in it. Well, he doesn't have to fight so hard against gravity. That's, that's true. Um, wrinkles don't form as quickly as uh, when you're uh, weightless. But they followed up two years later with For Your Eyes Only, released on June 26th of 1981. Uh, but it does that one does pretty well. It makes fifty four million dollars uh, in unadjusted dollars. That's twelfth uh, highest grossing film in the franchise. Adjusted, that is one hundred and sixty million dollars. Uh, Seventeenth highest grossing in the, the in the franchise. So it, it does well. It, it does better than um, Live and Let Die. It does better than Spy Who Loved Me. So it, there's some there's some success there. 
James Bond comes back in on June tenth of nineteen eighty three with Octopussy, the the literal summer of James Bond. Since there's also the that summer is Never Say Never Again. Octopussy also uh, a fairly high grossing film makes sixty over sixty seven million dollars in its time, which is the ninth highest grossing film in the franchise, probably because Pussy's in the in the title and eight of them. <laughs> That's true. Adjusted for inflation, one hundred seventy five million dollars. Uh, 14th highest grossing of all time. How, and beat Never Say Never Again as well. Beat seven, Never Say Never Again was the winner of the summer of James Bond. But they decide to follow that up. Roger Moore decides to go one more time. It comes back with A View to a Kill, uh, reviewed last month uh, by the three of us, released on May 24th, 1985. Grosses $50 million, which is, is decent. It, it, it's profitable. Um, that puts it at the 15th highest grossing film in the James Bond franchise. However, adjusted for inflation, that's only 150, 115 million. And it's actually the 21st highest grossing James Bond film. So it's down there just above the man with the golden gun licensed to kill in the living daylights. Um, Was he the oldest um, when he did beauty kill of all of the bonds? Is, did he finish up as the oldest? Yes. Cause Sean Connery, when he did two years before a view to a kill, He's two years younger than Roger Moore. Roger Moore was 55 in 1983, so that would have been 53 for Sean Connery, and he's the only one that comes even close. Everybody else hung and it up. And we're not even counting David Nivens as... No, I don't count David Nivens. That's not an official James Bond. So that is all the statistical information on the James Bond film franchise. Now, typically, we go into the musical section, which is Chris's section, but there's no real specific music to go over. Let's talk about Bond theme songs. Guys, what is your favorite Bond theme song of the Roger Moore era? And arguably, Roger Moore has some of the better themes uh, to uh, some of the better theme songs in his era of, of the film franchise. Chris, your section, why don't you go first? Well, I think he has some of the best and the worst. The, you know, the, the best are, of course, Live and Let Die, The Spy Who Loved Me, and View to a Kill. My favorite of them is, is uh, Carly Simon's The Spy Who Loved Me. Matt, what was your pick for favorite song in the James Bond film franchise? A live and let die is was an easy favorite for me. Uh, why why live and let die? I just think it's it's a really good tune. It's probably my favorite James Bond song from any era. And I'm not a big Carly Simon fan as we as we discussed previously. That is true. You did not do not like the easy listening of Carly Simon. <laughs> you are not so vain. That's for sure. You know, I, I've already reviewed this basically the the Bond theme songs probably with the exception of Skyfall. Uh, previously on lunchtime movie review and last last month i said i had a view to a kill down as my number two pick that was actually incorrect i actually went back and looked after we recorded and i actually had that as my number three pick number three but what i found really interesting is of my top three all three of them came from the roger moore era and i like chris have nobody does it better as the number one james bond theme song uh, was my overall back back when I reviewed it a couple of years ago, but I I still would agree that it's close with Live and Let Die, which was my number two. But I, I still would give. I, I think that song is just kind of quintessential James Bond. I, I still feel that Live and Let Die doesn't quite fit into the rest of the movie. I think that's why it's a little bit lower on my list of theme songs. You could have used maybe something a little funkier, <laughs> something more black exploitation like. A little more soulful shaft thrown in there. But I found it interesting. In my top ten, I have four of the Roger Moore era the songs. Now, well, what are the other ones? Uh, Nobody Does It Better, I had number one. Live and Let Die, I had number two. A View to a Kill, I had number three. For Your Eyes Only, I had it number six. And th- then uh, you don't have Rita Coolidge until you get down to like number 14. So, But it is, it is a dogfight to find out which my least favorite <laughs> Roger Moore song or Roger Moore era James Bond theme song. Both of those were at the time ranked 21 and 22. Wasn't the worst song in the franchise, but it was they were fighting it out for that second second place. Matt, what about your least favorite James Bond theme song? You guys aren't going you guys aren't going to like this, but it was probably viewed a view to a kill. 
Well, Chris will probably. Patrick's not going. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Patrick's not. I, yeah. I don't really care for Duran Duran, as I stated many, many times. Yeah, well, if you over, you you like Moonraker. You know, he, he, here's the thing. I don't remember Moonraker, which means I couldn't have disliked it that much. <laughs> but it also <laughs> has no, no memory whatsoever because it had no impact on you whatsoever. The well, me- hey, being punched in the gut would leave a memory on me, you know. Yeah. If an ugly person brushed by my shoulder, I would remember him. <laughs> the Man with the Golden Gun by Lulu? That, that, that doesn't stand out as a bad song to you? I'm sure it was. <laughs> All right, Chris, what was your least favorite Roger Moore era James Bond theme song? Shirley Bassey's Moonraker. Ah, okay. Now you're talking my language. Explain to me why that's so bad. Besides it just being a bad song, if I remember correctly, she was like a last minute addition, so she didn't even have time to prepare. And it was a little bit more, I don't know, disco y, I guess is that what we would call it. Well, that was the ending of the, the, the uh, opening See, I credit. I get them confused because it. They all it's it's all crap the the Moonraker themes but but yeah she she didn't have much time to prepare because um who was it Johnny Mathis who was the guy I don't remember no, so, somebody some- pulled out because they knew the song sucked <laughs> and uh, she she didn't save it so well as much as it might surprise you Moonraker is not my least favorite of the Roger Moore era although it was really close and I it's it, my knee-jerk reaction when you ask me what's the worst in the Roger Moore era to any question, I'm generally going to say Moonraker. But I actually put the man with the golden gun is my least favorite of the uh, Roger Moore era. Is See, I can't remember. Wait, can you sing a few bars? No, I cannot. <laughs> I literally, <laughs> literally cannot. He, he you has know, a- um, Herve Village has... Um, he dances very nice to the theme song. Yes. So. Yeah, the, uh, the, the song goes, uh, he has a powerful weapon. He charges a million a shot, which is it. The song is very much just summarizing the movie. It's just not creative at all. Plus, it's, it, it has the epitome of what I don't like about when the, the theme songs go horribly wrong is when you have to cram the, the whole title of the film into it, into the opening theme. And that's what they did with that one. So that that's what edged it out. Finally for me is that Moonraker was, it's a ridiculous song and I don't like Shirley Bassey, but at least they, it, it, they wrote a theme that I like, okay, Moonraker makes as much sense as anything else. Man with a golden gun is yeah, that's stupid. All right. But gadgets, what was your favorite gadget in the film series or the Roger Moore era? Matt. My favorite. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. My favorite gadget was the golden gun okay. itself. All right. I just thought it was really cool. The, just the idea of that, that solid, solid gold gun, which I, don't, I really don't think could actually work given how soft of a metal gold is, but, or his golden bullets just seemed entirely uh, over the top, but that's what I liked about it. It's kind of simple. It's low tech. But they found a way to make it really eccentric and really and really sinister. I like it. You know, I've got a tie um, in the gadget category for both uh, my favorite and least favorite. So for my favorite gadget, uh, it's they both come from the spy who loved me. Roger Moore's Lotus that turned into this submarine and it had all that cool crap on it, missiles and and or I guess those were torpedoes when it was underwater. Um, so I, I liked that. I thought it was probably one of his best uh, vehicles. And then uh, the tie with Jaws's teeth because he bit a fucking shark and <laughs> killed it. I mean, come on. You, you, how can you uh, dislike a gadget like that when a man is biting a shark to death? Okay. Well, Chris picked one of mine, uh, <laughs> and that was the Lotus. I liked it's something about the cars in the, the James Bond franchise, at least until they become invisible. But the I, I I like the Lotus and the Spy Who Loved Me too. I like that that you know. Granted, I usually like low tech, but I thought that that portion that gadget in that film seemed to make sense, and so I I really like the Lotus as well. Although it didn't shoot torpedoes, it did shoot a missile because it blew a helicopter out of the air. Okay, I knew it was shooting something. Yes. Uh, what about your least favorite in the series, Chris? You have a tie. I have a tie again. The first one was Man with the Golden Gun, the fake nipple. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that one. Oh, that's that's a good bad one. I forgot. It, it actually wasn't fake, Chris. They actually just covered up his fourth <laughs> nipple. Oh well, I'm a little bit more impressed then. 
And then it was a tie with that lame ass gravity machine in Moon- Moonraker. Lame ass uh, gravity machine. Oh, the uh, like the thing that for astronauts. The, the yeah, the- like when they were in space on the station, like it just st- started turning, and then all of a sudden, gravity is uh, we have gravity, and then they turn it off, and then you know they all start floating everywhere. So I was not impressed by the little gravity machine. <laughs> okay, Matt. Well, I think you know I'm going Moonraker. But mine is kind of a big tie. Every laser in Moonraker <laughs> was my least favorite gadget. All of them equally together. That's a pretty damn good pick, too. Yeah, that's 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 not bad. I can I can get behind that. Anything that any knock on Moonraker I can get. But once again, my least favorite not coming from Moonraker. It actually comes from a view to a kill. Q's robot. His uh, peeping Tom robot at the end of the has, his perverted his robot. perverted robot I, has no point in the the goddamn fucking film the entire time just it's not perverted it's British that, it's it just they show it in the beginning and I'm like okay he's going to use that rob that robot for some stupid purpose at some point in this and then he shows up at the end just to watch Bond you know diddle the little thirty year younger woman in the in the shower but. And and and, it, and part of it is also it was like that mid '80s. We got to have a robot and everything. I mean, that's why Rocky IV had a robot in it. It was just like everybody had a robot, and that was Bonds. It was like, oh, it's stupid. So didn't didn't, didn't they use that robot um, in uh, what was it? Short Circuit, where Number Five what needed a pet? I don't know. Could be. <laughs> uh, Bond girls, my favorite section favorite bond girl of the roger moore era and you got to pick one guys there uh, is not much to choose from but uh I, i'm going old school i'm going with solitaire okay why i'd never seen a young jane seymour before i i just always thought she emerged um from the womb as the medicine woman oh no she she has a long catalog of embarrassing films and television series starting with starting with uh live and let die then followed by the sinbad sinbad in the eye of the tiger and then culminating with battlestar galactica in the late late 70s she is well, a- I, th- I thought she did a, did a fine job i like kind of like her role and you know, I I, it, I wouldn't call her a strong first, but you know, I give it to her. Okay, definitely it was in my running. But Chris, yours? For mine, it was for your eyes only, Melina Havlock. Oh, really? The eyes have yeah. it, huh? The eyes have it. I remember even as a kid thinking she was absolutely beautiful, and um, to this day, I still think she's very beautiful. And she also. Uh, kicks ass in the film she outdid roger moore as far as i'm concerned i would be more afraid of her than him okay well also a uh, also a strong pick uh, as i said i i do not think the roger moore era uh is uh full of strong acting performances uh, for your eyes only she's apps I, I agree with you absolutely a beautiful woman cannot act herself out of a paper bag uh, so that that ultimately is why I did not choose her. Uh, Jane Seymour g- w- was my strong number two. I almost went with Jane Seymour, but ultimately I went with Barbara Bach with The Spy Who Loved Me. I liked her uh, her character as kind of the, the counterpart to uh, Roger Moore and James Bond, and I thought she at least she gave as good as she took for the, about three quarters of the film, and then she became the damsel in distress and, you know, uh, James Bond had to save her, but that's that's who I ultimately picked. But what she if, looked very nice in Egypt. I will yeah, say that. she did. She she was absolutely be- beautiful in the film. Uh, pretty much all of them are beautiful, but mm-hmm. they, they can't all be good, and some of them have to be our least favorite. So, Chris, your least favorite, Mary Goodnight <laughs> from Man with the Golden Gun. For Man with the Golden Gun. Well, I like Man with the Golden Gun, but. Uh, Britt Eklund yeah. doesn't do it for you? No. I, you know, she's, I don't know, she's kind of one of the dumbest Bond girls out out there, I, I have to say. So that's that's pretty much why I picked her. I had the same pick as, as Chris. I went with Goodnight. Ooh, I'm surprised. Uh, just, yeah, just, I don't know, just didn't seem like she, she added as much as the others probably did. I am shocked because there's one I see as a glaring bad actress in a glaringly bad James Bond film, Dr. Holly Goodhead. 
possibly good name, but horrible actress and does not. I, she she's very she's attractive, but I don't think she's that attractive that she can just trade on her looks in that particular film. And that's my pick. I I I cannot stand her. I, she just reads she reads her dialogue like it's you know she's reading a, a recipe book that there there's no emotion behind any of her lines. Was she the one with the really raspy voice? <sighs> she kind of, a little bit, but not too bad. Hmm. I not might like, be confusing her. I might even be confusing her with. Um, I think you're confusing her with Q. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're confusing her with uh, Pussy Galore because she had a raspy voice. I think I, I, think I might be. That's okay. what I was thinking. One last thing in Bond Girls: which one of the ones, which one of the Bond Girls were you most offended that Roger Moore was hitting on in the film? Grace Jones. <laughs> <laughs> well, it got it just see it just got more offensive with every movie as he got older and older. So my answer to that would be everyone in a view to a kill. <laughs> that would be the correct answer. Absolutely, all of the above. That, that's although the the young girl in um, for your eyes only. I'm forgetting her name. The one who wasn't even of age that he did not try to sleep with. He so did not. That's, that's an honorable mention for James Bond. But, he can work at Subway. <laughs> so, but probably that actress, older than Tanya Roberts in A View to a Kill, I'm sure. Uh, that would be correct, Matt. The correct answer is anyone in A View to a Kill. <laughs> All right, Bond kills. What was the best kill by James Bond? By James Bond. Well, I, guess, I guess we could just say any Bond, any death that was uh, created in one of the Roger Moore films. Well, for me, the, the best death is... I, I don't know if I'm going to say his name right. Apostas from um, For Your Eyes Only. For Your Eyes Only, where he took the that rock climbing spike to the chest uh, at the monastery and fell all the way down. That That's the one I think that stands out out of all the films, so I like that. And for bad guys, honorable mention, as I've already said, Jaws bit a shark and killed it. <laughs> I, I think my favorite is the, the fun house kill in Man with a Golden Gun. Because that's just a really that's just a great James Bond moment, you know. It's it's um, it's just great over the top Bond killing. Okay, uh, mine also comes from Four Your Eyes Only, but uh, it's it's a scene that bothered Roger Moore was uh, him kicking the car over the cliff with Locke in it, um, and th- th- throwing the dove in there right before he does it. I thought that was a really cold move by Bond, and I think it's exactly what the character is in the novels I, th- I think he's a cold killer and i don't appreciate roger moore trying to make him a little you know pithy uh hey, i kill people from time to time type of guy it, that scene is what i think is one of the best kill scenes um in the roger moore in the james bond film franchise i think it, it just it's, it's a good scene although i like yeah, it's a very good very good kill what about your least favorite kill well, I I have I have two answers because number one's kind of a cop out, but it's every space kill in Moonraker <laughs> is is my favorite. all of With them the together lasers? equally. Yeah, every, all of them. After that, it's um one I pick because I feel like they wasted so much potential, and that's the Christopher Walken on the Golden Gate Bridge. Same beef I had. If he's supposed to be this genetically engineered Superman, you can't. You can't make that your fight. You just can't. It was such so much wasted potential. That's actually kind of how I felt with uh, the ending of Doctor No, that it was a lot of missed potential. But for me, also, it comes from, for your eyes only, the very beginning, Blowfield in the smokestack. He's like this super genius uh, of uh, Spectre. Uh, he's been dogging him for years and years and years, and that's how they end him, just to, just to piss off some uh, people in the legal battle totally unacceptable yeah i I, th- I like it for the fact that it was a big f u towards what's his name for having the rights to blowfield but mine actually goes back to the, the beginning of the roger moore era live and let die uh Kananga getting killed by putting an air cartridge in him and blowing him up like a balloon i thought that was very wildy wildy coyote and i thought it was ridiculous and couldn't stand that it, to this day it still bothers me watching him or some fake you know stunt thing flying into the air and then exploding in the room that was that was kind of ridiculous i think that's the worst kill in the uh roger moore era and there's a lot of bad ones in the roger moore era because i agree with your bad ones they're both bad as well but that one is not that bad or not as bad as that 
I will say one of the things that I liked about Live and Let Die was uh, his voodoo sidekick. I forget his name. How he came back from the dead at the end. I, I did like that. A, a little spiritual voodooism. All right. Villains. Best Bond villain in the uh, Roger Moore era. This one, it was pretty close, but um, the one who sticks with me, I, I like uh, Christopher uh, Christopher Lee as Francisco Scaramanga in The Man with the Golden Gun. Uh, why? Well, first off, I just like Christopher Lee. But, you know, this, it was a different kind of movie. It was more a, a one-on-one um, match cunning and skill versus one another and he came off as as a big fan of bonds and um not just somebody looking to to take over the entire world through some absurd plot and uh you know it was more of a personal pride sort of thing a different villain than we've seen in the other bond films so i i like that a lot yeah i i picked max zorin because i just i really like christopher walken <laughs> And I thought he did a good job. And I thought he was something kind of sinister in a new way for us in, in the Roger Moore series. Could you the do an impression of him for us? <laughs> I, I, I could, but uh, I need more power. Oh, that was <laughs> worse than anyone would have. <laughs> but I really, I really liked it. You know, the, the, that he would, um, you know, defy the KGB, kind of go out on his own, and then be so so bad as to shoot all his own men. I thought that was... Thought With that a was smile it. on his face, too. It was a new level. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm going to agree with Chris. I liked Scaramanga in The Man with the Golden Gun because I did like the fact that it was kind of a different Bond villain. It wasn't a take-over-the-world villain. It was more of a... I, I guess it was like a you know machismo type thing. He just wanted to, to, to challenge himself by taking on Bond, who's supposed to be his equal in his eyes. So... Um, I thought it was it was indis- an interesting break from the take over the world or take over the drug industry or whatever the the person whatever the main villain wanted to do. And so I liked that character, and I do like Christopher Lee. Uh, I do think he did a, a really good r- job with the role. And uh, al- although uh, the, I don't think he needed to be a sporting, I think he could have just killed him and said, "Yep, took out the number two guy." Now I'm no one to challenge me. But all right, least favorite. Um, yeah, I, I kind of use the same criteria I used for the song, and I'm going with Christatos. Okay, because I, he just didn't he just didn't stand out to me as a, as a good villain. He just seemed a little too much like a suit. I guess I don't know. Okay, I I can see that one, Chris. Uh, Hugo Drax for putting me through that two hours of shit. <laughs> That's all I have to say. He's I, I am completely annoyed with him. Yeah. Well, Chris, I'm usually right there. I thought that Hugo Drax was gonna gonna be there, and then I remember saying something about the actor saying, "Okay, I like the way he delivered some lines in that film." I thought, you know, make sure some harm comes to Mister Bond. And I like, I like, oh, I like that. I like that that he had some good lines. Um, however, he was repeating this basically the same performance as from the previous film, which had a much worse villain in my my viewpoint. That would be Carl Stromberg, who I still, even to this day, other than he wanted to wipe out all life on Earth or something like that, I, I was well, never. He was going to rebuild. Well, yeah, but who is he going to rebuild with? He didn't have a lot of people in his little underground spider submarine type thing. So, but those people he had were beautiful. No, that was Hugo Drax. He had the beautiful people. Oh, was it Hugo Drax? Yeah, see, that. there you go, getting the two films that have the exact same plot, except for <laughs> one is in space and one is underwater, you know, so that I, I can understand your mistake there, you know, why you get confused, but yeah, he's... Because he had webbed fingers? <laughs> we never saw those, unless you looked really closely. I'm hoping I can redeem myself if we look back and all of the people are beautiful, but otherwise I'm pretty sure I had them perfectly confused. I don't... He had Jaws there. Oh, wait. They both had Jaws. Oh, my confusion now. So, all right. Uh, now... now the, the one in Moonraker was a female Jaws. He was a complete <laughs> pussy. All right. Ranking the Roger Moore films. Worst to first. Least favorite Roger Moore film. This, this should be easy. Should be no. easy. It's Moonraker. Okay, you got the right answer. I just wanted to make sure that you... Yeah. No, it's definitely Moonraker. All right. I'm not going to even ask why, because we know. 
We, we understand. Chris? Moonraker. All right. It, it's, a, it's a trifecta. Moonraker, worst of the Roger Moore film series. Possibly worst of all the, the, the films, but we'll, we'll get to that at the end. Okay, number six. Uh, I, I went with For Your Eyes Only. Really? Yeah. yeah. And I, it, it, it might be my fault. I was somewhat preoccupied when I watched it. So I might not have given it a fair shake, but um, I just remember being kind of bored by it. We're going to have to have a talk afterwards. Chris. Live and let die. Why? I am not a fan of the Roger Moore is not going to get dirty in this film. I still remember him going to walk over the alligators and thinking he's not going to get his clothes dirty. He's too pretty. And uh, mix that with black exploitation, and you got number six up for me. All right. I can understand all that. Minds of you to a kill. Grandpa Bond just doesn't do it for me. And there's horrible acting from most of the cast, with the exception of Christopher Walken. I know because Matt likes Christopher Walken, mm-hmm. who's ch- chewing up scenery and playing Christopher Walken. And he's entertaining to watch because he just seems like he's having such a good fucking time while he's playing that role. But everybody else is just lo- moving at half speed, and just is it's just horrible. So, a view to a kill is my number six. Chris, though, what's your number five? My number five is a view to a kill. Oh, okay. Why? Actually, I think it's a little bit higher than yours, simply because there's a bit of nostalgia on it. I mean, it, it's definitely one that was on the HBO loop that I that I saw a lot. You know, free eyes only, Octopussy, and View to a Kill are probably the three that I know the best out of every single James Bond just because that's all that played during the summer. So, But it's not the best story as much as I like Christopher Walken. Uh, Roger Moore is past his prime. We've already said that. And um, I don't, Grace Jones has gotten worse, and that's um, not starting from a very good point anyway. So, <laughs> I went with Octopussy. Okay, why? I mean, not a strong reason. It just it just felt on the more weak end of um, of the Bond movies of this era. The the Fabergé egg stuff, you know, the the smuggling. Eh, I don't know. It just it just didn't excite me. I'm going to go with Chris's number six, "Live and Let Die." That much for the same reasons that I not so much for that Bond's not going to get his suit dirty, but the black exploitation the the kind of voodoo aspect of it i just it, it it plays off kind of hokey to me and never got any better um the the villain seems kind of very unworthy of being challenged by bond but uh, you know that's that's just the story it was so yeah i put that as my number five but chris you're number four halfway through uh my number four is octopussy okay why um, I mean, I do like uh, I do like Maude Adams a lot. I think she uh, is uh, she's great in it. But the, you know, this is really where I think Roger Moore was pretty getting pretty uninspired. The, the story is not necessarily the best. It's not the worst. I think it's just a ho hum film. You know, just pretty much nothing spectacular about it. I went with a spy who loved me. Really? Now this one. Uh, now you've taken out two of my top films actually you've taken out all my my top three so i really am curious what the, the rest of you are gonna are, are gonna be it's not a knock against it i just didn't like it as much as the last three i thought the last the last three each had something kind of kind of unique going for them so it, it's just more of a um not, I'm, you know i'm not gonna put this one down as much as i'm gonna i'm gonna tell you why i like the other ones okay my number four is the man with the golden gun, and it's and this would probably be my line in the sand between what I think the good films of the Roger Moore era and the bad films are. Is that the man with the golden gun? I generally think it's a good film. I think the other three films are a little bit better, but I think it's a very entertaining film. It has some weaknesses that Britt Eklund is not really good in the the lead role, but or lead female role. And Maude Adams is not the best actress. I thought she was better in Octopussy than she was in The Man with the Golden Gun. But uh, this it, it's an entertaining film, but I think the other three are just a little bit better than this one. Matt, you're number three. My number three is Live and Let Die. Okay. Chris and I both have put that down there at, towards our bottoms. Why? I, I, thought, I thought kind of the... Um, the 
black exploitation plotline was kind of refreshing. It was something different than we're used to. It was something a little more local. They kind of took us to some some cool places. You know, I liked I liked the Harlem. I liked the the southern stuff. That all that. So I I th- I think it's unique among um, Bond movies, and I didn't think I didn't think they executed it badly. Was Live and Let Die the first one where we had the racist cop? Yes. And I can't believe nobody's brought that guy up yet. <laughs> but, <laughs> Chris, you're number three. My number three was the man with the golden gun. Okay. Now, in a good way or bad way, why is it your number three? Uh, no, it's a good way. I like the film a lot. I think my last two, I like just a little bit more. Um, as much as I like Christopher Lee and uh, Hervé Villachet, um I, I just like the other two a little bit more. I don't really have a knock against this film. All right. My number three is Octopussy. And although you guys have both put it further down on your list, I, I think this is a good James Bond film because it is more spy driven, less gadget driven, considering I haven't played the spy who loved in me, which is all gadget driven. But uh, the, I, I like the story because it, it, it is, it, it's letting Bond be a spy in the film. And he's, you know, he's working espionage. He's looking, he's, he's going undercover and he's actually got, you know, there's, there's some stakes in this, the atomic bomb and he's stopping the, 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 the plot from the mad Russian and the, you know, guy from India from the, um, Gigi, uh, pedophile, uh, from blowing up the American base. And I, I think that was a much better story than a lot of the other James Bond films. So that's why I put that one there. Number two, Matt. Number two, I liked a view to a kill. <sighs> All right. Why? <laughs> well, it wasn't for the acting or for the plot. I, I really liked I really liked the um, the Bay Area locales. I really liked the uh, a lot of the other sets they chose, and I'll say it again: I really liked Christopher Walken. Oh, okay. Uh, when you, you watched the film, were you uh, trying to uh, impersonate him as he spoke? And poorly every time. <laughs> Chris, your number two. You know, uh, my number one and number two probably could have been interchangeable. Uh, originally, I had this number one and until I was starting to think about my favorite songs and gadgets and all that. So it slipped down to number two, but it is for your eyes only. I, I like, uh, you know, as I said, Melina Havelock. I like uh, the the monastery scene at the end. It, it definitely is the most nostalgic for me. I, I do think this is the one that I know backwards and forwards. And even though I hadn't seen this in many years when I when we reviewed it a couple months ago i still knew most of the lines so there it, it's there's a lot of bias in this one because it's so nostalgic all right you've already gone right right matt mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all right my number two is the spy who loved me and uh you know that's it's where things started to work for the you know, really really work well for the roger moore uh, series i thought uh, up until they went to moonraker in the next film but i, I thought Roger Moore was really starting to look comfortable in the role. The first two films, he looked a little uncomfortable. And I really like, I like kind of the, this is one of the few, uh, villain taking over the world storylines that I actually really like a lot. And, uh, I think it was very unique as the introduction of jaws when he was still a bad guy, uh, that you had uh, the gadgets, you had the Lotus, as we've already talked about, that I thought worked really well. Everything in that film, I thought, just worked from top to bottom. Not as well as my number one, but the, it, it was it was pretty close. But my number one goes to will be a film that I is more in line with what I like in the James Bond films series. But that being said, Matt, your number one, uh, Man with the Golden Gun. This this is a surprise to me. I would never expected you to pick the man with the golden gun. Why would you pick that? Well, I, and I think a lot of the things Chris said about why he liked like Lee as a villain, I think have to do with this movie. I like I kind of like the the assassination angle. The the nobody's trying to he's not trying to take over the world angle. I thought Lee turned in a strong performance, and so I th- I think it was just kind of the most solid plot and character and execution movie of the whole bunch. Chris? My number one is The Spy Who Loved Me. And as I said, it, it could have been interchangeable one or two. 
I like very much uh, Jaws as a villain, as a bad guy, not his stupid what they did to him in Moonraker. I think that he was so good. It's a testament that they brought him back in the in the second one, in, um, for, from just his presence in that in the Spy Who Loved Me. Uh, I like the gadgets in it. I like the theme song. I like the villain. Um, I like the Bond girl. It's my number one. All right, my number one is uh, Matt's number six for your eyes only. And part of this, I agree with Chris, is probably nostalgia. Is this is the film that I have. I've probably seen this film probably 60, 65 times because it came on so many times when I was a kid on HBO that I just sit down and watch it every single time. And I know it backwards and forwards, but probably more to what I've grown to love about the Bond franchise is when they're low on tech and more on just story and uh, action and having him be a spy. There's not a lot of gadgets in this. It, it, it doesn't approach that world of the unbelievable like Moonraker does. I, I, I do think there's there's some really good sequences in this film. I really like Locke's death. I, as Chris said, the mountain climbing sequence I think is one of the best shot as well as most suspenseful action sequences in any of the James Bond films. I mean, when he gets kicked off the mountain and that guy does that stunt where he's just free falling, I mean, that that's pretty intense. And then having Bond climb up the rope, I, you know, I thought that was a great sequence and it's, it has its drawbacks. I don't like the hockey rink sequence, but that's, you know, that they, they, they're not all perfect. These, these are still Roger Moore films, but his, uh, his car upside down, slowly spinning that yellow one, that that's not a big, yeah, yeah that, that one doesn't even bother me. I like the fact that Roger, that Bond is not in his, you know, his Lotus, and he doesn't have all his gadgets. Once again, the, almost symbolic of, hey, we're going to take this back, and we're going to strip him away from all his gadgets and see what he can do. And that's why I like that film. I think Roger Moore should have ended his run with that film. I think that would have been a good place to stop. Although Octopussy wouldn't have been bad either, but For Your Eyes Only should have been the end of the uh, Roger Moore era, and I think he could have gone out on a pretty good note. So that being our rankings of the uh, the James Bond films, uh, me for your eyes only, Chris the Spy Who Loved Me, and Matt with the Man with the Golden Gun. A very surprising pick. I would never have picked that as a. a He's nip- a sucker for fake nipples. Yeah, what can you say? I know that's mm-hmm. it. Just just gets his juices flowing. All right, final fake, the better. <laughs> the final words on Roger Moore and the Roger Moore film franchise. Uh... Could have been worse. <laughs> you know, it had its moments. They did some of the things well that I like from Bond, but they kept him on just way too long. And and by the end, the last the last I don't know, two movies or so, it was it was distracting how old he looked and how unathletic he is. Well, you know, my view of him is always gonna be tainted because this is the James Bond I grew up with, you know. His first film was pretty much a, a year after I was born and his his last one was all the way through, uh, I believe that was junior high. So I know him the most well of all the James Bonds. Uh, and there's so much nostalgia that uh, I, I have to, I just like him. I mean, I understand that he, he's got all the faults. He stayed on too long. He was more of a pretty boy. His humor I don't like as much now, especially with Austin Powers. But he is still the James Bond that I know. You know, Roger Moore will always be kind of the uh, father who raised me because I agree with Chris is that he is he grew I, I grew up in his Bond era that he was the Bond that I associated with because his 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 movies were the ones that were coming out in the theaters they were showing on television that they were showing on HBO and I I you know I identified with his Bond for the longest time i mean he was the father that raised me sean connery is the father that begat me you know for begat the character at least and i didn't really know who sean connery was for a long time probably not until i was in high school when i started to go back and watch some of the earlier bond films that i hadn't seen yet i'd seen a couple here and there but not as with the frequency that i'd seen the roger moore and even then i still probably identified with the roger moore up until Pierce Brosnan came along and I started to see differences in how 
the the bonds that I would like, you know, how I would like to see. I started reading the novels around then. I started really kind of understanding wh- what the character was, and as as I became more aware of where the character, the, the origins of the character, the novels, and then seeing Sean Connery's films on a repeating basis, that. Roger Moore just started to pale in comparison when you compared it. It just seemed to be just a, a you know a uh, a parody of what the James Bond character ultimately was, and, and and that's a shame because he did some good films. I agree with you guys that he should have hung it up longer. He did some some very good films in in the time frame he was there, high grossing films for the Bond franchise. Although you know once Pierce Brosnan and Daniel Craig came along, that the the stratosphere that they reached in their box office grosses is just it's an impressive but it, it's interesting i would like to have i wonder what would have happened if you know he would have hung it up a little bit earlier to the bond film franchise and if you would have seen something go on much longer than what timothy dalton's run was if if if, the, if he would have gotten it a little earlier or if they would have gone with someone else Probably I wonder if they would have had uh, Pierce Brosnan uh, start a little earlier. I, I don't. I when don't, was his Remington Steel? Remington Steel had been on for two or three years uh, preceding them trying to do Living Daylight. So he probably wasn't. It. They knew who he was because he had been on the set of For Your Eyes Only. And someone, had, uh, one of the producers, I think it was Broccoli, had said uh, he, he might make a good James Bond someday, but he was young at that point. And I don't know if he would have had the age that they were looking for or the nor- notoriety. I mean, he would have been, if they would have went to him with Octopussy or around that time frame, he would have been a complete unknown. And that would have been a risk for him. They, they tried that with George Lazenby, and that didn't work out very well. So uh, they, I think they would rather go with a known property. I think they would have gone with Burt Reynolds. <laughs> well, let me ask you. You know, if they had gone with Burt Reynolds, those closing credits where he just smacks uh, every guy and laughs <laughs> about it the whole time, that smacks, would have been awesome. Smacking Q upside the head. <laughs> Call me Captain Chaos, will so, you? Let me ask car you. chases would have been great. Yeah. Let me ask him, what kind of car does he drive? <laughs> All right, that does it for this month's review of the Roger Moore era of James Bond films. Thanks again for joining us and listening to our little monthly podcast. If you've had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can follow us on Facebook at Movie House Memories or on Twitter at MH Memories. On either Facebook or Twitter, you can keep up on our written film reviews, news on upcoming films and Blu-ray releases, our little forum section that's just been added recently to the site, and information on upcoming podcasts on the MHM Podcast Network, including Movie House Memories, Lunchtime Movie Review, The Number Two Review, and of course, Mail Bonding. And I think we're going to have a new podcast where Matt just does impressions of movie stars. He has a it's a running conversation between Jimmy Stewart and Christopher Walken, except for Christopher Walken. Sixty minutes at a time. Jimmy Stewart goes. It's it's real talk with Matt. Why why do you keep talking about power? (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm going to do it until I get it right. What you need to just work on is just making punctuation points between words randomly, and you'll get a better Christopher Walken. Power, ha, huh. <laughs> that's what I think. <laughs> oh, that was good. All right. Just Ad- watch Biloxi Blues. Yeah. <laughs> Additionally, you can follow us on our little side projects. Chris hosts the number two review podcast, which also can be heard on the MHN Podcast Network. Additionally, you can follow him on Twitter at Haley Creative. Matt appears regularly on Movie House Memories, the podcast where we review the greatest films of all time, and you can follow him on Twitter, at Haybucker. Finally, if you've enjoyed yourselves and you've downloaded us off either iTunes or Stitcher, make sure to rate our podcast on either one of those two platforms, and if you have a chance, write a short review of the podcast. Of course, we always like the reviews that are positive, but we appreciate any feedback that we can get from any listeners of the show. Well, that does it for this episode of Mail Bonding. Next time, we review 1987's The Living Daylights, Timothy Dalton's first of two appearances as James Bond. And if things go right as far as scheduling, we will have the roaming Australian Shane from Lunchtime Movie Review, who appears to be the Timothy Dalton James Bond film fan who wants to come on the show and review those two uh, films with us. So that's what we're looking forward to. But until then, I'm Patrick. I'm Chris with the golden microphone. And I'm still old. And we'll see you all next time in our house. 
This podcast is not endorsed by Eon Productions and Sony Pictures Home Entertainment and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. James Bond, all names and sounds of James Bond characters, and any other James Bond-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Eon Productions and Sony Pictures Home Entertainment or their respective trademark and or copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is intellectual property of MHM Podcast Network, Movie House Memories, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted.